Hi, I'm Alvaro Enrique, and this is the lesson for the study number seven by Matteo Cacassi. I'm putting down on the description of the video or somewhere on the screen uh, information on how you can watch the performance of this video. I must begin telling that uh, this study, which is part of our first semester of our technical course at the Escola de Música de Brasília, which is equivalent to intermediate level in some places. Uh, there, there will be on the description also information how to get this material. Um, on our audition, it's written only study number seven, but I must warn you that this study comes from a larger opus called the 25 Melodic Studies. Until recently, I thought this was the only work on the guitar repertoire to be called Melodic Study. My colleague at the Escola de Música de Brasília, Igor Loli, showed me some examples of studies that do also share this title, but Mateo Carcassis was the first one. Uh, to be called Estudo Melodico, Melodic Study. So, what do you expect to work or to learn on a melodic study? I expect to learn how to play melodies. And this is what we must focus on all of those studies. Very, very often, we don't talk about melody on those studies and talk only about fingering and those are not the fingering studies or the technical studies or the virtuosity studies those are the melodic studies so it's very important always to talk about melody and melody on the tonal system this music was composed during the peak of the tonal system uh, it means also talking about harmony because the harmony determines or shapes the melody. There is also something that we must talk, which is the motif. The motif is uh, a short segment, a short uh, group of a, a melodic shape or a rhythm shape that would be the same as a Lego piece of a larger structure. So each motif is one tiny Lego piece that together they form those amazing structures. So we must talk about these two things. And in this study seven, how Carcassi dealt, dealt with harmony and motif um, makes that study almost like a sonatina. If you compare this study with Paganini's sonatinas for guitar, well, I would say that Paganini probably would call that a sonatina because it features some elements that are more commonly found on Allegro's de Sonata, uh, these first movements of sonatas and deal a lot with how to uh, cope with motifs and harmony. Let's talk about it. We begin with this very short uh, chromatic motif. This is the first motif of the, pe of the piece. Then we get to know the second motif. It's a descending uh, group of 18th notes, or 80th notes, yeah. Uh, then, uh, on the next measure, you, we are going to see the third motif, which is... This 18th note, followed by 16th notes, in a descending scale. Though this is the third motif of the piece. 
and almost all pieces will feature only these three motifs. Those are the three Lego pieces which you should uh, find throughout the piece. About harmony, it begins at the tonic, the tonic is A major, then it changes to the dominant. more than dominant of the dominant. Then it releases to the tonic. To the dominant, sorry. Dominant. And it ends on the dominant. Then it go, go back to the tonic. It repeats. Then here we have this at first, it sounds like the subdominant, but later, when we hear this uh, B, we find that this is the relative subdominant, subdominant. Either way, it's a subdominant function, so be it subdominant chord or uh, subdominant relative, it's a subdominant function, which is moderate tension. It's just Subdominant relative, then dominant with six and fourth. It's a cliche of the uh, classicism. Before showing the dominant, you put a six and a fourth, which makes this chord having the very same notes of the tonic, but with the dominant fundamental, the 50th of the tonic chord, the E, in this case, on the bass. But it's not just because the E is on the bass, but it's also because it will go immediately to the dominant. And then, as it goes to the dominant, then it releases to the tonic. Okay, so at first we see these three motifs, one and two, one once more, two, then we learn, we meet motif number three, then motif number three again, motif number one, and two, one and two, and then motif number three inverted. So. When there is an inversion of a motif, what was going down will go up. What was going up will go down. So this motif that was before now will be uh, an ascending scale. But can you recognize it's kind of the same pattern but inverted and the same rhythm. This is as you would take your Lego piece, instead in use of using in, th in this traditional form, you turn it upside down and use it as uh, in an upside down fashion. This is the inversion of a motif. It's easier if you make those inversions to create better, stronger, larger structures with the same Lego pieces. Uh, okay. Uh, about fingering, in this, you know, this is chaos. When you have to pluck more than one finger on the same string, usually that's the major obstacle to reaching higher speeds. You can reach higher speeds by adding some slurs on very uh, specific and magic spots or by keeping the hand in an arpeggio fashion. I've played, you can watch on the video, uh, this A major ascending scale on the end of this first part, also in campanella, so I could reach a higher speed. At first, it's quite confusing because for the left hand, it's a very unique fingering. It's something probably you have never saw before. Imagine studying it, but after you practice a little bit the left hand and memorize where to play, 
it's quite easy to play it fast. So this is the fingering that I played. A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, D sharp, D sharp, A, but it could be also this, and then A. Okay, you, the last note, you, pref you decide which is better for you. And with uh, finger two, and then make a line, larger jump, or end with four and not jump at all. It depends on what you prefer, the jump or to make this contraction, very intense contraction. Okay, then we go to the second part. The second part features this third motif uh, inverted. So it's a, a scale, but ascending, the same rhythm. Then the second motif. Then a variation of the first motif, instead of B, it changes to a B. And also changes a little bit the shape of the notes. But this three inverted, two, then one altered. And then three, mo the third motif once more. And regarding harmony, we are at the dom, we just ended in the tonic. Then we begin at the dominant. Then the dominant of the dominant. And we end at the dominant of the dominant. The next phrase will be at the dominant of the dominant. The same motif work. Then it plays once more the first motif, the second, then new material. I have not heard this motif before. It comes from the second motif, but it's not the same. But it's also part of the start of some fragmentation of the melody and also the start of the what would be a development in a sonata. So here the first motif was more. This is the dominant of the tonic anti-relative. Wow, that's far. So it's the G sharp and then it releases to C sharp minor, which is the tonic anti-relative. Each chord has two relatives. We are more used to use the relative itself, but the other chord it's called anti-relative. They are not enemy of anyone, but each of those chords uh, they have two notes in common with this uh, main chord which they are related to and depending on where you go up or down then the name changes for relative or anti-relative. So uh, a, ma a, a major, which is our tonic, it's A, C sharp, E. It's relative, you add one third down, then it's F sharp, A and C sharp, two notes in common. But if you go the other way, if you, instead of, we'll get back to A, C sharp, E, then we do C sharp, E, G sharp, then we have the anti-relative, which is the C sharp minor chord. And we, the Carcassi made an uh, individual dominant here, dominant of the C sharp minor, the tonic anti-relative, and then the, toni the tonic anti-relative just before. Then it fragments. Notice how in these past two measures, very far chords. So it's important to give a different atmosphere, different color, different tone, different dynamics. It's very far. So you are reaching some unknown territory. Make a listen 
uh, understand that they are in, in, uh, in an unfamiliar territory. So we showed the first motif, second, then new material. First motif, second, new material. Then just chords with new material. The tonic relative, dominant of the dominant, and it ends on the dominant. Then the third motif, inverted, of course. Uh, then it will modulate to C major. Boy, C major is a very far scale from A major. Close scales usually share the same tonic because they also share the same dominant, so it's easier to change from A major to A minor. That makes them close tonalities, but also close tonalities will have only one sharp, one uh, flat, less or more. When you change from A major, three sharps, to C major, no sharps at all, it's far. But it's not that far. We are going to see that there, there is an entrance and an exit door for A major and C major, and Carcassi uses that door to reach this different dimension. Uh, so we are in C major. C major is the new tonic. We begin at the tonic, the new tonic C major. First motif, second, and then new material, which is pretty much an arpeggio. First motif, second, and then arpeggio. Then it goes to the dominant. Tonic, C major, then E major, E major in C. E major is the dominant of the tonic relative. The tonic relative of C major is A minor and its dominant is the E major. Hey, but E major is also the dominant of A major. C that was the entrance and the exit door. It's not a coincidence that before the modulation, the chord was the E major. Then it changed to C major. It's far, but there is this entrance door to a different reality. So go, let's go back there. E major, dominant of the tonic relative. Once more. And keeping, keep uh, notice that this is an inversion of the second motif than the first motif. Then the tonic relative, A minor. Then new material. This and Carcassi will reach even further chords. This is what makes this part of this study more close to a development of a sonata than all the other parts. This is where listeners and you should expect the unexpected. It's part of the game for the listener. This is the time where unexpected things should happen. So you can play it more unexpectedly, you can be more expressive, you can reach your higher range of dynamics, or color or agogic. This is this a very special place which you, the listener, the composer, gave you a license and everybody gave each other a license to make things unexpectedly. So use this license to be as expressive and as uh, imprevisible as possible. And this is the dominant of the dominant, then all dominant. This is also a dominant, but dominant with 6 and 4, we mentioned that before. Then it goes back to the dominant, and here... Carcassi 
has in the musical form the cadenza. It makes a suspension on the dominant chord. And then it will back to the first theme. This is a great cadenza, Ricasi already wrote. It's a very good cadenza, especially because it uses previous material, like first motif inverted, also first motif inverted. Then it keeps altering the very first motif. But because the suspension, you can use that cadenza to create suspense without changing the notes. You can maybe a little too much. Okay. You can decide what to do, but there are many things you can do. You have a license. You can do anything you want on the cadenza. And the cadenza especially, it's really anything. It's the most powerful license a performer has to do whatever he or she wants to. So then we are back to the first part and it's a repetition as it is. It's a very wonderful piece and I recommend you because it's very important for that piece to make clear those motifs, those very parts that we study by little bits. So study, for example, only the fir very first and the second motif. Ah, no. Now it's nice. So let's go to the second. Now it's okay. So let's join the first with the second. And this is how you should study. But to study that way first, you need a metronome. The metronome will help you a lot to uh, be able to study at the level you need to really learn. And then as you know exactly which commands should be ordered, and then you can, uh, your mind zipped these commands as the computer zips also the files then you can reach higher speeds. The metronome you, will help you in, to achieve these higher speeds but respecting the speed of your mind. Also, you need to use some control gain. One very good control gain that I use, I recommend you to do, and Barrios used that, was you use, I call this uh, V or F, right or wrong. Uh, you start with three objects. Barrios used uh, beans, bean grains. So he put those three beans grains. You can use peas also, three peas. And as he played well, correctly, he changed one of the beans to a victory position. When he made a mistake or he put back one being on the victory position to the starting position or he changed one of the beans to a losing uh, position. And then when the three beans reached a victory position, then he, was, he conquered the game, the passage, and then he can study another passage, okay? Or uh, play it faster. Another variation of this game is when you should write down. When you make, uh, when you play it correctly, you mark down a V or R R for right. And when you play it wrong, you mark W for wrong. And an R cancels a W and vice versa. So if you play it correctly, you mark R. Then you play the wrongly, then you cut this R. 
Then you paint Bromley once more. Then you mark a W. Then you play it right. Then you cancel this W. And so on until you reach three R's. In either case, victory comes by playing correctly three times in a row. My study, that study, like I class it this way, and keep in mind those ideas of how harmony be uh, unpredictable when you should be, uh, when unexpected things happen, when unexpected chords, far chords, when you're reaching uh, different places, be more unexpected, uh, unpredictable, use more dynamics, articulations, and remember, this is a part of a melodic study. Shape the melody. It's about the melody. Have fun and good studies.